I got my first COVID haircut in a very long time. So until recently, there actually was quite a bit of work I had to do to look presentable um, on screen, but it's a bit easier now. Oh, yeah. If there's one, if there's one advantage to just to just losing all your hair, it's it's so easy to do COVID haircuts. You just you just yeah. buzz the whole thing and you're done. It's great. Right. Totally. Hey everyone, thanks for joining. Um, you know, we're a bit early, so we're gonna give folks a few more minutes to to join. But thanks for your punctuality. Still can't believe that this is a thing. <laughs> it's so fascinatingly surreal. Yeah. You're in your 15 minutes. Right. Wild times. getting that adjusted there. Yes, yeah, so I've got kind of a high level intro and then I'll just do, you know, I'll say something about slides. We'll, sure. we'll, we'll figure out a great system. It'll be wonderful. <laughs> it's going to be great. All right, we look at, have about 10 folks on the line. Um, still a little early. Thank you all for joining. Um, just give us a, a few minutes to let other folks pile in from their previous calls and then we will get started. All right, thanks everyone for joining. Um, this is a 60 second grace period starting now just for folks running late from their last call and then we will get underway. All right, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, first, thanks everyone for joining us today. For those of you joining us for the first time, uh, my name is Eric Zimmerman. I'm a director at Hathaway Communications and along with my colleagues, um, we serve as the secretariat for the STAT communications community. Um, this community grew out of the broader work of the state and territory alliance for testing, a group of more than 30 states now um, and territories convened by the Rockefeller Foundation, um, who meet regularly to share insights, success stories, lessons learned on all aspects um, of the COVID response. 
Um, and an increasingly important part of that response has been communications. What's working? What have we learned? When and how do we need to adjust course? Um, answering those questions is the goal of this community um, and is the goal of each of these biweekly webinars. Um, we're really excited about today's session uh, because we get to indulge in something that I think has been missing from many of our professional lives, at least uh, for most of the last year, um, and that's humor. Um, and we've chosen this topic not just for a change of pace, uh, but because humor can actually be an immensely valuable tool in forming connections um, with our target audiences. You know, in most of our webinars, um, at some point, the idea comes up that the messenger is just as important as the message. Um, and we talk about the importance of finding trusted messengers with whom our audience has an authentic, personal, or cultural connection. And we brainstorm who they might be and how as public health communicators, we could partner with them. Um, but we don't often talk about how we ourselves could actually become more trusted messengers, how we can form authentic, meaningful, um, even personal connections with our audiences, how we could have a relationship with them, not just as authorities, uh, but actually as in some ways peers. Um, one way we can start breaking down those barriers is by changing the tone with which we communicate, not just the message. Um, and humor is one really valuable way to do that. Uh, plus studies show that it can often be fun too. So that's a bonus. Um, so we're really thrilled to be joined today by Kevin Parent. Um, Kevin is the social media lead for Ottawa Public Health, um, which is actually the most followed on social media local public health unit in all of North America. Um, and the way they've accomplished that is simply by being themselves, um, using humor and authenticity to form connections with their audience. So Kevin's here not just to teach us all how to tell jokes, um, but to talk about how and when to use humor in public health communications, and just as importantly, how to navigate all the challenges that come from using a lighthearted tone um, in what is you know, not always a very lighthearted context. Um, so Kevin, welcome. Um, I'll turn it over to you in just a moment. And just a reminder to the group, as you have questions today, please leave them in the chat or in the Q&A function. Um, and we will either be fielding those as we go or collecting them for, for the end. Um, so your, your participation is encouraged and we'll be saving at least 20 or 25 minutes for a Q&A session. Um, so Kevin, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Eric, for that uh, wonderful introduction. I'll forgive you for spelling humor wrong in the title slide. That's totally okay. You know, it's fine. You sure. guys will get it eventually, it's fine. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Kevin Barron. I work with Ottawa Public Health uh, up here in, in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, where, as you can see by my, my dress, we're enjoying some wonderful tropical weather. It was nearly 60 degrees Fahrenheit today, hence why I decided to dress in a nice uh, summery fashion. So yeah, what I'd love to do is just kind of have, have a nice conversation today. Um, I, I've brought some slides, uh, some examples of the things that we've done, and then and then my my hope is that we can just have a really great conversation at the end of it. So, as as Eric said, we we're very proudly the most followed local public health unit in North America on Twitter. Uh, it's it's something that blows our minds to this day that uh, you know people have taken such an incredible interest in in a, a municipal public health unit of all things. Um, and really, as as Eric was saying, it it's. Uh, strategy of authenticity is the strategy of engagement. Uh, we have an audience first approach to our social media. Everything we do is is starts with the audience. It focuses on the audience and it ends with the audience. Um, you know, traditional large scale government and corporate comms, it's it's broadcasting, right? Everybody, you know, it's that classic agrarian word. You know, you you cast your seed as broadly as you can. So traditional approach uh, to large scale social media was always that it was put an exceptional amount of effort into crafting, you know, what you think is, is the greatest message possible. And then you, you send it off and the moments it goes off, you know, your work is then you move on to, to the next, um, the next project on, on our little crew. Um, you know, we have this running thing that when the message goes live, that's kind of when our work starts, you know, once it gets out there, then that's the opportunity to engage, to have conversations with people, to remind them that there's real human beings on the other end of the account and just really drum up that, that human, that, that authentic feel. Um, a lot of our content comes from our audience. Uh, we, we are big believers in the notion of speaking with our audience, not to our audience. So the overwhelming majority of, you know, our, our most successful content that we've put out and, and most of the examples that we'll look at over the next little bit 
uh, are all ones that came from our audience, came from narratives that were being set online, recurring comments we saw or whatnot. So we're always trying to, to see where people are, see what concerns they have, see what narratives they have, and, and then go meet them there. Um, and Ottawa, uh, you know, for those that don't know, we're Canada's capital, we're a, we're a government town. Um, we are the city that fund for God. We're, we're very proud of that. We're, you know, and so very often we get to kind of play with that and, and meet people in that space. Um, the first example, if, if you're able to throw it up, this was just one of those moments where only people that work in government institutions will understand this one. It was just one of those times that we've all been there. We've all had to open Internet Explorer for some reason or another and wondered why it insists on attempting to be our default browser when, well, it just it just absolutely shouldn't be. And that was one of those posts where, you know, it, it's going directly to that audience. You know, Ottawa has a lot of office workers. Ottawa has a lot of government workers. And it, it was a great opportunity to just kind of step into that space and, and put out something that's relatable. Um, and kind of on a segue of that is I'm not sure if anybody's aware, but, you know, there are people out there that don't actually agree with everything that public health is doing right now. It's shocking information, I know. And so we often have to find ways to deal with that and to address that. And we are faced with a lot of you know, misinformation and disinformation and we, and we address them accordingly. And more often than not, it's just a, it's seen as an opportunity to educate and an opportunity to, to provide good, you know, reliable information. But sometimes again, we're able to kind of sprinkle a level of humor into there. And the following one is just an example of taking, taking the conspiracy theory at face value and then deconstructing it from a perspective of logic in a way that only government people would properly understand. So this post, I mean, it's one of my favorite things that we wrote. And it really was just a way of saying, like, we appreciate the flattery of thinking that we could pull this off. But like, have you met us? Like, we're, we're the government. This is not, this is not, we'd still be deciding on who's going to be in the committee to decide what to name the virus. Like, this is just not something that we'd ever actually be able to do. And one of the great things about posts like this is that, you know, it uses humor as the vehicle to drive the message and the vehicle to get people to engage with it and share it. But at the end of the day, it is just a post reminding people of the amount of misinformation that's out there and giving people a little bit of a, you know, a light bulb, an aha moment about, oh, that's right. You know, all these people saying this is a global conspiracy. It's really not all that, you know, plausible that that would be, uh, that would be something to go with. Um, and one of the things that we, we always strive for, as I said, you know, is, is that it's that engagement, that interaction. Um, there's this fascinating thing that plays out on social media. You know, fascinating if you're a nerd like me. Um, when Ottawa Public Health puts that tweet out there, that's ours. You know, it's, it's our post, it's our message. It's got our brand on it. Like, you know, our profile picture is our logo. That, that is Ottawa Public Health's message. But if Eric were to take it and retweet it, he takes ownership of the message. He looks at his followers and says, okay, well, that was Ottawa Public Health tweet, but now I want you to see it. You know, me, Eric, I want you to see this message. And the only way that Eric is going to be willing to put his name on it is if it's something that he actually thinks people are going to enjoy or find value in. So whatever that value may be, be it a really good, you know, useful piece of public health information, a really good did you know, or in, in cases like this, just maybe a moment of levity and a laugh. And it's those interactions that help to give the account uh, a really human feel. Then the next one is one of my favorite examples of that. This was uh, Josh Pringle is a uh, he's from CTV Ottawa, you know, local media outlet, and he's he's phenomenal on Twitter, very active. And he he mentioned to us that you know we'd had no Humidex advisories as of July third, which was for us a great way to remind everybody that not only is it July second, but confusion is a very common sign of heat stroke. Um, and it's that it's that human and engaging manner by which messages like these work because they're they're not your typical message from a government you know account they're they're human they're open they're real and one of the things you'll notice with this is it's that quick turnaround as well um, we're known for our speed we're known for our nimbleness you know social media is an incredibly fast-paced environment and i'm not sure if you're aware governments aren't usually known for their speed on things so we have processes internally that have allowed us to be responsive, be nimble. We have a thing called our three sets of eyes where in order for a post to go out, you know, it doesn't have to go through 
10 layers of approval. It has to be seen by a writer, a subject matter expert, and then, you know, somebody position of authority. And that allows us to be, to be quick and nimble and, and move on things like this. And one of the, one of the things that, that's great about, you know, having that audience first approach is that it allows you to cater your messaging to where your audience is at the time, because as much as, you know, we're here to talk about our use of humor, some of our most effective messaging in the pandemic wasn't even funny at all. It was moments of candor, uh, time to, you know, just just be real and be genuine, and address something. But again, it was driven by things we were seeing. Um, the next example is is just phenomenal for that, if, if I may say so, because we had seen numerous conversations about this. We'd seen conversations on Reddit, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. People were talking about how, you know, cashiers and, and retail employees were getting harassed by people who were upset about uh, the mandatory mask laws that were implemented last July. And, you know, even our media relations team had flagged to us that they were seeing questions coming in from the media about this. So we moved quickly on it. We crafted a message and we got it out there. And I mean, this, that one post, the last time we looked at it, I think it had, had about 16, 17,000 likes. Uh, it's got well up over a million impressions. It did incredibly well on Facebook as well, but it was because I, it wasn't, you know, a humorous moment. It wasn't an anecdote, but it was something that everybody was thinking about. And it was something that everybody was talking about. And it was a wonderful example of just meeting people where they are. Now, the next one is kind of a similar uh, space in that of, it goes without saying that everybody's not really okay right now. You know, it is completely okay to not be okay. If you're sitting there watching this and, you know, these have been some of the most difficult times that you can remember, th there's nothing wrong with you. It's entirely all right to not be okay right now. And quick reminder, uh, seeking out help and asking somebody for help is a sign of, of courage and not weakness. And I highly recommend that people seek out mental health resources if needed. But this was one of those posts that, that just kind of needed to be said. You know, it was based, it came from the heart um, you know, I'm a, I'm a father myself, and I was dealing with online learning and, and working and whatnot. We'd been seeing a lot of a lot, a lot of a lot of pain, a lot of struggling on our accounts, and we needed a way to get out there and address it. Um, and one of the great things about this is that it's also it's a perfect segue because it has the word perfect, and I'm terrible at segues. So mistakes happen. Um, we make mistakes all the time. Uh, probably, probably more than we should, but it, it's just, it happens. Things move so quickly and everything's exceptionally fast paced and, and mistakes are going to happen and you can't be afraid of them. You know, you, you can't be seeking to always have like the perfect tweet and the perfect wording or whatnot, because that's, that's completely impossible and it's not human. And what's fun is every now and then when you make a mistake, rather than running away from it, if you, if you own it and roll with it, it gives you a really great opportunity, again, to, to be human and be authentic. And this next one is, is one of my favorite examples of that. Um, so we do, we do beach water testing uh, all summer. You know, and we let people know what, what, what beaches you can swim at and what beaches you can't swim at. And this post went out and it was just a simple typo and we included the same beach on, on saying it was okay to swim and not okay to swim. And quite a few people got rather confused by it. And it gave us an opportunity to just sort of run with it and own the mistake. Because yeah, by the way, Twitter doesn't have an edit button. Just, it's fine. It's okay. I'm Canadian. This is as upset as we get about things. But um, it was just that, that great opportunity to, to be human and to own the mistake. You know, traditionally it would have been a, okay, we'll delete it right away and put it back out. Maybe have an apology or whatnot. And this, no, we, we said, all right, we made a mistake. We owned it. Let's let's go with it. Um, and that whole having a humility is is one of the best things that you can do as you know trying to be an authentic communicator online. We don't necessarily take ourselves too seriously when it comes to the fact that we make mistakes, or in the case of this next one, when we legitimately, because we were all a little busy around that time of the year, forgot to renew our subscription to Getty Images. Um, and, and we ended up in a space where we had a few days of content that we needed to write and we had no access to our stock image account. So we decided, you know what, let's roll with it. Let's roll with it and have some fun. So this, uh, this is what happens when you let non-graphics designers work in the mastery of Microsoft Paint 3D. Um, you know, I encourage everybody to, to experiment and see what you can create. Uh, I clearly have zero graphic design skills, but 
it was it was different. It stood out. It was fun. It was engaging, and it allowed people to to just kind of share a laugh while also, you know, pumping up some some flu messaging because, you know, once upon a time we talked about things other than COVID, and what's what's fun with these is it allows you to to sit back and remind yourself that yeah you know what it's not always going to be perfect uh and they're also not always going to be home runs one of the things that you have to do if you're going to be working in this environment is you need to have that humility of accepting the fact that just because you think that this might be the absolute greatest thing you've ever written it might not land that way We've had posts that we thought were going to be the absolute greatest thing we've ever posted, and they fell flat on their face. And it's just because, you know, maybe some people didn't think the same way, maybe it wasn't appreciated, whatever. And this next one is probably the best example I could think of. I'm, I'm, an, I'm an old, I mean, as you can tell by my hairline, I'm not a young man. And I'm an old dad, and I like making dad jokes. And I was so proud of this. I mean, I laughed out loud to myself for, for numerous minutes. Um, and I think, I think in grand total, this, this tweet got like seven likes. It just, it's it. It fell flat. Um, I, I think Twitter sent us a letter just saying stop. But what, you know, what we took away from it was just that, okay, great. We'll try again next time. You know, it, let's not, let's not take it to heart. Uh, let's not, you know, beat ourselves up. Let's just, let's just roll with it and go. And that's kind of, you know, it's, it's a nice little segue as well, because as we've discovered, I'm terrible at them. It's a great segue to reminding yourself of the mental health aspect of this. Um, there's a lot of awfulness out there online. And, you know, if there's a, if there's a danger, let's say, in the audience first approach, it's, it's the exposure to that. You know, we read, we read every single comment, we read every single reply, you know, we try to respond to as many of them as we can, but it's imperative that we read them so that we can keep track of the narrative. But that also means that you're you're inadvertently exposing yourself to a lot of the a lot of the negativity out there, a lot of the hate out there, a lot of the anger out there. And I mean, it cannot be stressed enough the importance of taking care of your mental health when you're somebody in one of these roles and being mindful of the way that the negativity can impact you and being mindful of the ways that <clears throat> that you know you have exposed yourself to this environment and put yourself out there and you know, Ottawa Public Health is a phenomenal organization for that. There's so many great supports uh, and resources internally. And, you know, I, I openly invite you to, to seek out those resources within your own organization and make sure you have them, you know, handy when you need. Um, and with, in terms of us, you know, with our organization, we, we've done a very slow change from within. You know, one of the things we get asked all the time is, you know, how did you guys get approval for this? And how, how do you get away with it is, is one of the most common phrases we hear. And with us, it was about, you know, maintaining that, that change management from within. Um, we have above us absolutely phenomenal individuals in supervisor, manager, all the way up to, you know, Dr. Vera Etch is our, our medical officer of health. And they are so exceptionally supportive of what we do. And one of the reasons they are is because we have provided evidence for everything we're doing. You know, as much as you need to be mindful of your audience that you're speaking to, you have to be mindful of your audience that you're working with as well. You know, in public health, the, the people that we work with are, you know, doctors, nurses, epidemiologists, health experts. So these are people whom everything about their profession is evidence-based. So we have a running joke in our organization of the, the social media team's book reports. You know, every time we wanted to do something new, we had a new idea, we had a new direction we wanted to go. Rather than just throw a post out there and go for it, the first thing we would do is we would build research reports. You know, the, the very first time we wanted to be tongue in cheek with sexual health, for instance, you know, they raised a few eyebrows in the organization, obviously, because as a government account, that's a, that's a really interesting space for you to want to step into. And so we sat down and we wrote a six page research paper about it. And we found the actual documented, you know, studies that have gone into the effectiveness of using humor to reach uh, younger audiences about sexual health, because sexual health is a very stigmatized subject. There's a lot of people that believe that sex should stay in the bedroom. And the way that you will allow, you know, as I said before, with, you know, somebody like Eric who takes ownership of a post, well, if it's something that he thinks is going to be awkward and uncomfortable and is going to make people kind of shy away from it, he's not going to want to share it. But if it is uh, a funny, humorous, engaging style post, he's going to be that much more likely to share it. It becomes an icebreaker. You know, we've said so many times, you know, our mission is to break down stigma on things like this, because if we 
you know, can't actually talk openly about something, how would we ever expect, you know, younger adults to talk openly about it? So that led us to our sexual health posts, which have, have had some very interesting success. This one was the first time that we really decided to go out and see if, see if we could push the envelope on, uh, on sexual health comms. And it came, it came from nothing more than a member of our team saw that product at the store and had a giggle. And then we decided to, to roll with it and, and go for it. And sure enough, it was exceptionally well received. Uh, it did ridiculously well on Instagram, which is where we wanted it to with our, with our younger audiences. We kept this going through the pandemic as well, which is, which is the next one where we decided to remind people that not to be picky, but I mean, the whole wear protection when inside is not actually a new public health message and has been around for quite a while. And again, this was another example of, of a post which, you know, is just, it's just a vehicle. It is a vehicle to get that message out as far and wide as you can. And coincidentally, we did another one this morning, which was a way of addressing uh, some of the, um, how do I put it, less than wonderful comments and replies that we get on social media. If uh, I think we, we included this one, maybe. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so again, sometimes people don't like us on social media and we decided why not turn this into a positive and remind people that indeed, you have encouraged us to have intercourse with ourselves and we might as well, because that is the safest thing to do during a pandemic. Um, yes. That one is still doing exceptionally well today and has garnered quite a few interesting comments and replies, but it, it's just, it's that style, it's that openness, it's that humanity. It is reminding people that, yeah, by the way, there's a lot of negativity out there online and, and you know, this is the way we'll roll with it. So the, uh, the, the last part of this is kind of the thing that everybody asks us about. Um, everybody wants to know uh, the thing about Bruce. Um, we can honestly say that when we wrote this post, none of us, none of us ever expected it to, to do what it did. So the backstory here is leading up to the Super Bowl, we had a series of posts going out. Uh, I believe they were starting on the Thursday. And we took the approach of just not taking ourselves seriously. Like, my goodness gracious, we are not cool. Like, we're, we're a Canadian municipal public health account. That is the farthest away from cool that you could possibly be. We are not Wendy's. We're not some cool brand. So all of our posts for the Super Bowl had kind of the same language. I believe the one on Thursday was, if you're planning on watching the sporting event this weekend, please follow these guidelines when watching the sporting event. And so the one we wrote for Sunday kind of followed that same, that same feel. And um, I decided, I, you know, I, I'm like, I'll take one for the team. I'll make sure to be online Sunday evening at, you know, 1030 at night to get this post out. And this really was just a bait. That's it. It, it, was, it was a blatant bait. The name Bruce was picked for no other reason than it was short because we needed something to fit with character counts. And there was something about the name Bruce that just made it easy to get mad at. And no offense to any of the Bruces out there, but the whole thing was a bait to get people to reply and say, you had one job, Bruce. So it went out and it began blowing up and we were online to be able to be responsive and roll with it. And the next one is one of my favorite interactions in the entire story of, you know, as some people were questioning whether or not this was real, whether or not some poor individual named Bruce was about to get fired. And then this individual gave us a, a nice opportunity to just roll back and say, no, no, this is entirely intentional. Um, a fun side note on this, which isn't in the slides. And again, I'm running fast and loose with fun, but we know I'm a nerd is that the next day we noticed, um, you know, Monday morning, we noticed there were a good amount of people that had actually taken it seriously and thought that, you know, we had this inept social media intern that couldn't do his job right. So we quote retweeted ourselves and turned it into a lesson on misinformation. And we analyzed all the different aspects of the tweet, you know, such as why would we make the image? Like seriously, stop and think about that. Why would we have gone through the effort to make an image that has insert logo here so that somebody late on Sunday night has to re-Photoshop the image to get rid of insert logo? Like it didn't make any sense. And we walked through about five different pieces of evidence that showed that it was in fact an intentional gaffe and it allowed us to, you know, just make light of the moment. And then, and then something fascinating happened. Um, a short while after we got a DM on our Twitter account. Um, from an individual named Ryan Reynolds. He, uh, in Canada, we know him and, and, and worship him. He's actually, he's actually in our national anthem. I'm not sure if you're aware. So he sent us a DM on Twitter saying that he really loved what we were doing. 
And we replied and you know, we, we thanked him, it was very gracious, but then we had an idea. And when we ran the idea past him, because as, as you can see from the date on this, this was about a month after the, the Bruce incident. And as recently as that day, there were still people commenting on our post saying, great job, Bruce, or you know, good tweet, Bruce, or whatnot. It, it had become this sort of little cult thing with the followers. And so we took a huge gamble and we threw this Hail Mary and we, we pitched the idea to Ryan Reynolds. And being the incredible individual he is, he, he accepted and said, sure. Uh, a script was written uh, in a day and it was sent to him. Um, curious side note, he replied and said, no problem, I've made it for you and I'll text it to you. So that happened. Uh, and, then, and then we were able to package the video and add the different graphics and put it out. And what I enjoy about it was that it wasn't a big, you know, tag Ryan Reynolds and blah, blah. it was, we, we approached it with as much humility as we possibly could. And, and I believe you can, you can play it so everybody can see the, uh, the video of what he did. Caroline, I'm not sure if it's rolling. It's not rolling for us. There's no audio, actually. This is all. This is all a joke. Please, please laugh. Here we go. Hello, I'm Ryan Reynolds. Most of you may know me from that episode of Sabrina the Teenage Witch. But what you likely don't know is that I often go by another name. Bruce. No, not the musician. No, not that one either. Um, no, I'm talking about Bruce uh, from that Ottawa Public Health Super Bowl tweet. The Bruce who forgot to include the winning team name uh, and the logo. That Bruce, yes, that's me. And yes, I occasionally tweet from Ottawa Public Health. Why? Everybody does. <laughs> Look about the Super Bowl. In my defense, these days I'm just I'm so busy. Okay, so just so back off. Right on Super Bowl Sunday, I just I forgot. And while there's nothing I can do about that tweet now, there is something else I can do, or rather, something we all can do. We can do this, and we will do this. Steady as she goes, Ottawa. Steady as she goes. Yeah, so that happened. Um, I, 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 even watching it now, I'm still in in on disbelief about it. But as we said, it's the most successful thing uh, we've ever put on any of our social media accounts. Um, the comments continue to this day. We are still, you know, today's sexual health tweet had people commenting, complimenting Bruce on on his work, and. I just, I, I adore it. I love it. I, I love seeing the interaction. I love seeing that people are comfortable with the account and, and want to engage with us and want to ask us questions because at the end of the day, you know, the, the messages that a public health unit puts out, you know, even not in a pandemic, but, you know, especially during a pandemic, they are, they're so vital. They're so important, but let's be honest, they might not be the most exciting messages on the planet. And in the world of social media, when everything is about, you know, fast paced and, and scrolling like crazy, it's, it's about getting their attention. And the more we can have people interacting with us and feeling comfortable with us, the more likely they are to actually stop and read our posts when they come across them. Um, you know, our, our manager, Eric LeClaire is a wonderful individual. And he has always said, you know, it doesn't matter how good your message is if nobody's paying attention to it. And that's kind of the that's kind of the way that we approach all the things that we do. Um, I'll admit that I didn't actually uh, have a way to end um, this uh, this sentence, so I'm going to just sort of awkwardly stop talking and wait for us to commence the uh, the question and answer period. Well, yeah, I, I'm so glad that you mentioned that's a perfect transition into my first question, um, which is that you know it strikes me that some of the the content that you've shared. Um, you know, the humor isn't just about getting likes, getting retweets, it, that it actually provides a bridge for your account to have 
a voice, to have a personality, to have a perspective. Um, and that allows you to also use the emotions like candor or empathy, you know, as in the content about the, the cashiers being yelled at for enforcing mask rules. So can you just tell us a little bit about like what humor has kind of opened up for you in terms of the other strategies and tactics and ways to interact with your audience and kind of a broader range of emotions? Oh, absolutely. It, um, it, it's, it's as you said, you know, humor is humor isn't the answer. It's just one of the tactics. You know, the the answer the answer to doing good social media isn't just to go out and start cracking jokes all the time, um, it, but it is it is a tactic that you can have in your arsenal when you want to go out and, and be authentic. You know, and and you mentioned Eric, like you mentioned, you know, empathy. Um, you know, all of our comms, especially during the pandemic, you know, it's it's driven by those those pillars, those foundations of crisis communications. You know, if you, if you talk to talk to anybody, you know, uh, internationally, you've got Peter Sandman, you know, here in Ottawa, we have uh, Josh Greenberg, uh, the, the late and, and truly amazing John Rainford. Uh, you know, these are people who talk about the need to have, you know, empathy, transparency, honesty in your comms. Um, you know, in a, in a pandemic, you're asking a lot of people, like you're asking people to change their day-to-day -day life. The very least you can do is, is be empathetic and acknowledge the difficulty in that and be transparent and provide the reasons why. And humor is just sort of a, an offshoot of that. You know, it, it's, a, it's a way to maybe provide a moment of levity. It's a way to maybe lighten the mood, um, but it's not an absolute answer. You know, we, I've lost track of the amount of times that we've had a post that was quite humorous. It was scheduled to go out, you know, say 1030 in the morning on a Tuesday, but then the mood online that morning, maybe in response to something in the news caused us to shelve it and pivot. You know, it, it's, a, you have to, you have to know when it's okay. And you have to know when it's the right time to, to use one tactic or another. Yeah. Yeah. And that's actually, uh, I'm going to turn over to the Q and a here as questions are coming in. Um, and the first question um, from Hillary Saviello was sort of about the right the right moments and the right content to use comedy or not. So the question is, comedy is such a great tool to tell a story on social media. It's not appropriate for all content to be funny. How does your team sort of use these skills to help make it interesting? Oh, great question. And probably one of the most valid points that can be raised in this entire presentation is is that, you know, it's not it's not always the answer. It's not always the answer to be to be humorous. There are some subjects that you are 100% going to want to shy away from, um, and there there's times where you're going to be tempted to use humor, and you and you know you likely shouldn't. The shame is there's no, I mean there's no set answer to it. You know there's there's no set in stone guideline of like okay, this subject be funny, this subject don't. This day be funny, this day don't. It's a matter of of having that relationship with your audience. You know being in tune with how people are feeling, what people are saying, and you'll, you'll know. And I'm not sure if that, I'm not sure if that's an answer that, you know, you're going to love, but you, you'll know, you'll know when it's time and you'll know if it's a subject that, you know, you'll be able to, to play with and be humorous with based on how your audience reacts to the ways that you've talked about that subject in the past. Yeah. yeah. Uh, next question here, I think is one that we can all probably relate to, which is about time management. So given the need for a quick response, so if you're going to be topical, you have to be sort of in the moment. Um, how does your team manage their time? Is someone on duty 24 seven? Do you still run all messages past a subject matter expert, even if it has to be quick and topical? Absolutely. Um, so the, there's a few things on that. In terms of time management, I mean, the, the core team works, you know, eight to four, eight thirty to four thirty, Monday to Friday. Um, Ottawa Public Health, because we're a as, as a public health institution, we have an on-call structure, you know, so 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there, there's a medical officer of health, there's a public health inspector, um, there's a duty officer, there are comms officer, et cetera, and that allows us to, you know, respond to situations that might happen outside of business hours. Um, you know, in, in, uh, in Ottawa, we had uh, tornadoes touch down, you know, a couple of years back, which anybody that knows auto knows that's quite rare for us and it happened you know well after uh, business hours so we needed those people to be able to respond to it in communications um we sort of have an expectation you know where the account is not going to be ridiculously responsive on weekends or, or at 10 o'clock at night um so the there's that but we will you know if people comment on something tuesday night at eight o'clock they'll likely get a reply wednesday morning in terms of the the how do we structure ourselves to be able to respond to things um, with key messages and subject matter experts, we keep a bank, we keep a bank of all of our approved content. Um, 
and the key message, you know, the core key public health message is, is verified and vetted, and then it's stored. And if you have to just maybe tweak a lead in sentence or whatnot, you're able to do so in pivot. Um, so all of our COVID messaging, I mean, granted the COVID messaging tends to expire in a shorter time frame than some of the others, but we have a bank of approved content that we can, that we can reach to, you know, um, in Ottawa, we have to issue frostbite advisories because we've chosen to live where, you know, the air can kill you. Um, so it allows us to, you know, when the temperature is going down, it allows us to grab a message and toss it out. And we don't have to go through the entire approval process because the message has already been approved. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the last thing you mentioned, um, well, not the last thing, one of the previous things you mentioned about when you respond with your audiences, when they can expect a response. So uh, related to the next question that we got, which is, do you have any guidelines for, you know, when to engage with followers and, and when not? I can imagine there's a lot of rabbit holes you could go down with responding to everything that might be funny online, but could, could cross some boundaries or cause more trouble than it's worth. So how do you know when to, when to dive in and when to pull back? Well, with that, you, you tend to have to use your instincts on that one. Um, you know, we have a really good relationship with our, with our audience and we're, we're, we're quite in tune with, um, you know, the things that, that they're going to want answers on or not. Um, for, for me, I guess it's just, you know, if, if there's a value in it, you know, if, if there's a noticeable perceived value um, either to your audience, the rest of the audience or the person you're talking to, to get in there and respond, then by all means, go for it, you know, and if it's a humorous post and somebody made a joke and you want to acknowledge it and joke back, fine. But, you know, if it's something COVID related, if it is, you know, somebody asking a, a very serious question or something important or whatnot, then yeah, you know, you'll take the time to go in there and educate and inform. Um, there are, as we said before, shockingly, some people who do not agree with, uh, with everything we're saying. Um, and with those, you have to judge just passionately because sometimes it really is just a, a circumstance of somebody has been given a piece of incorrect information and they've based their, all of their thoughts and opinions on that. So if there's an opportunity to go in and educate and inform, then you do so. Uh, and if it really is just pure disinformation, then we very often will, you know, mute and move on. Yeah. Yeah. One, um, I wouldn't say design flaw, but design question about what you've laid out comes from the quick approval needed from all the different, you know, the three eyes in the process, um, which is related to another question in the chat here, which is how do you create a culture of quick approval so that everyone is, is comfortable and that frankly, everyone is incentivized to respond as quickly as your team wants to get out this great content. Oh, absolutely, a great question. Um, you know, I do realize, you know, as here giving a talk like this, that, you know, not every organization is, is structured like ours. We are unbelievably blessed to, to have the structure that we do. Um, but the way that we got buy-in internally was by, by showing evidence, you know, showing evidence of the progress um, you know, something as simple as, uh, let's say, you know, ticks and, and Lyme disease, you know, is one of the subjects that we talk about. And a couple of summers back, we took a, a really different tack on how we were approaching that, uh, that comms. And we, we made a, a series of videos, you know, because you have to accept the fact that there are some modes of communication that are better than others. And it, there was a lot of resources that had to go into it, and it was difficult to get buy-in for it. But once we produced the first couple, we were able to start actually tracking results of like traffic, increased traffic to the web page, uh, increased access to to you know testing, um, more people who were doing self checks and bringing ticks in, you know, veterinary officer or et cetera, et cetera. So we were able to approach that group within the organization and say, hey, by the way you've identified these goals as part of your mandate and this shift in communications has helped you achieve those goals. Mm -hmm. And once they saw that and saw that buy-in and saw that value for themselves, they, you know, they were on board and now they're a part of it. Now they are willing to stop what they're doing and help us when we need help with, uh, you know, say a quick approval because they recognize the value in it for them. Yeah. I'm particularly curious to hear the answer to this next question, um, which is, Oh dear. Gabrielle, it says, I'm afraid to create a crisis trying to use humor. Um, only to share my admiration and ask if you have ever been near a reputational crisis because of this. Um, you know what? It um, it's interesting. You know, you, you kind of have to you kind of have to stay stay true to your roots. Um, at the end of the day, you know, we are we are we're a public health entity. Our our mission is you know to pr protect protect the health, prevent you know severe outcomes, et cetera, et cetera. So we there are a lot of humorous things that we have thought of over the last while that my goodness, they probably would have been the most viral tweet ever, but we all likely would have gotten fired and it would have been one heck of a way to go. So 
you have to play within the boundaries of the mandate you're given. You know, you you build your reputation, you build your brand based around, you know, why do you have this account? What is the goal of the account? What are you trying to achieve? And, and you stay within that within that space and you, you tend to set your own boundaries that way. Yeah. You know, it struck me that, um, you know, much of much of the content that you're sharing earlier is is based on the idea that we all have these shared experiences, either during the pandemic or otherwise, that, you know, humor means that we can acknowledge those shared experiences and our reactions to them and not just, you know, pretend they don't exist because it's, you know, a government account. Um, you know, but the, the downside of that or the complication to that um, is, is related to this next question from Laura Callan, which is that humor is often subjective, you know, according to specific cultures or populations, or right? something that's funny for the US or Canada, um, not that that's always the same thing, uh, may offend audiences in other countries. So any advice on how to handle humor when your audience is global and or divorce, uh, diverse may not share all the same experiences? Absolutely. Um, with that, I mean, as I've said, you know, we, we are lucky. We speak to the population of Ottawa. Yes, some of the posts have been shared virally, so we're able to, but we cater our, our messaging to Ottawa's kind of unique, you know, personality. Um, but if you are doing this on an absolute global scale, then yeah, you, I guess you need to find that common denominator. You know, you, what, is, what is that shared experience that absolutely anybody who, you know, has thought about topic X or interacted with topic X or whatever your key message is, what is that shared experience that is kind of that, that global feel? Um, and you have to though, be ready for the fact that, yeah, it might not land well with everybody. Um, even, even today, you know, we made a, we made a tongue in cheek sexual health post and there were probably about a handful of comments and replies of people saying, you know, I, I, uh, I can't believe my tax dollars paid for this. This is incredibly inappropriate. And those people got a very honest, open, heartfelt reply saying, you know, we, we do apologize. Um, if you felt this wasn't appropriate, we are doing evidence-based communications, trying to, you know, engage with as many audiences as we can. We actually provided links to a couple of peer-reviewed studies that they could view, and we gave them uh, a medium through which they could they could continue the conversation with us further. Yeah. You know, it's that acceptance that it's it's not always going to be a home run. It's not always going to be something that lands with everybody, um, but you need to be ready to acknowledge, you know, that in your audience if they don't uh, if they don't like it. Yeah, and how that, you know, that kind of reminds me that when you're in the you know, the frame of mind of, of telling jokes and throwing things out on social media and someone, you know, responds in an antagonistic fashion, there's probably a temptation to just go back and forth with zingers, right? Or to kind of keep that antagonism alive for the purpose of humor. Um, and it sounds like you deliberately don't do that. So how hard is it to do that? And, and what kind of guidelines do you set up for those responses? <laughs> I, yeah, I'd be lying if I said it isn't tempting every now and then to, yeah. to I, I believe, I believe the young cool people call it clap back. Um, yeah. But again, as per the hairline, I'm not young and cool. Yeah. With those, with those, it, it's kind of, kind of what we said before, right? It's, it's what is that mandate? You know, we are a public health organization. Um, if, if the reply isn't actually going to, you know, further deliver a health message or, or really drive a key message home, then, then there's no point in doing it. You know, it'll, all you're going to do is satisfy your own personal need to have the, the last word or the last laugh, but that doesn't, that has nothing to do with your brand's mandate. So we, uh, we tend to shy away from it that way. Yeah. Um, so the next question here, I think is a good one, um, which is how do you manage a different kind of neg negativity, which is not just criticism of, of your tone or whether humor is appropriate, but actually substantive criticism of, of the guidance that the department is, is giving out. Um, humor sort of may have its limits there when it's responding with a functional or factual information. So how do you, how do you navigate that? Well, with that one, again, it's, it's a matter of analyzing it case by case. Um, you know, COVID is a perfect example of that. There's always somebody that's gonna disagree with whatever the policy is. Um, and how do I put this? You ever hear the phrase, you know, people always say, ah, oh, that's social media, but this is the real world. I always laugh at that because social media isn't some separate far off world. It, it is the real world. It's just another way that we've chosen to communicate. Once upon a time, we used to do it by phone and or sometimes we wrote letters. Now we use social. Um, so the ways that you interact and engage with people in your day to day life is very often similar to in social media. And there's times when you can be having a conversation with somebody and you, you'll know, like you'll just know that this person isn't really going to respond to, you know, being given proper, correct information. But there's going to be other times, um, the best one I can think of is, you know, masks. When masks were made mandatory, there were quite a few comments and replies we got um, 
from people saying, oh, well, what about this study that says that there's no evidence that masks prevent the spread of COVID-19? And we got that same comment so many times that we knew exactly where they got their information. And where they got their information was a cherry-picked quote from an abstract in a study in the Journal of um, the Annals of Internal Medicine. And the full quote was, while there's no direct evidence that masks limit the spread of COVID-19, there exists enough anecdotal evidence to support their use as a public health measure. Now, this was way back in last, you know, midsummer 2020. So there's since been more information, but it was situations like that where there's an opportunity to say, okay, you're disagreeing, you know, with the key public health message. But the reason you're disagreeing is because you have been given incorrect information. So here's the proper information. Here's the study that you're you're talking about. And you know, you move the conversation forward that way. Yeah. Yeah. There a clarifying question in the chat, which is can you repeat sort of who those three eyes are? And then I'll I'll tack on to that. How do you how do you stop them from ruining your jokes? I'd imagine you know editing <laughs> by committee, even if it's a small committee, doesn't always lend itself to to creative juices flowing. So how do you manage that process? Um, well, with that again, you know we're lucky enough that we have that that buy-in. So with us, it's you know there's always a content writer, there's always a subject matter expert because you know again I am not a doctor. Um, so we need to have you know that subject matter expert that we can reach out to, and then yeah there'll be a manager or supervisor. And, you know, it's about finding that middle ground. There have been times where there's a post that we wrote and when the three sets of eyes got on it, you know, somebody's like, mm, I'm not sure about that. Maybe we should change this. And then, you know, we will say, hey, well, the reason we chose that exact phrasing was this, you know, the reason we, the, the, we wanted to say this this way was, was based on this evidence. Um, and, you know, you have those negotiations, you, you have those negotiations based on analyzing risk and determining, you know, what's the best course of action. And the larger the group involved in that, yeah, the most likely it's going to be that uh, the humor might not actually um, come out, but it's about building that internal process to allow you to, you know, find that middle ground between being as engaging as you can while also staying within the, you know, your, your mandate of being a taxpayer funded organization in our case. Are, on the flip side of that, are there instances where subject matter experts um, kind of want to get in on the game and offer their own jokes that you have to review and or gently veto um yes absolutely uh but sometimes it actually works for us we had a we had a thread a ways back talking about the um we analyze we analyze wastewater in ottawa to detect um levels of covid in the wastewater and we had a, we had a poop thread it had the word poop on probably about 20 times in in the span of about a nine tweet thread and one of our medical officers of health who's one of the most stoic people i've ever met in my life wrote a poop joke and it absolutely floored me. And we included it for the sake of saying, you know what, I'm in. You wanna get in on this, this is fantastic. I'm in, let's include it, you know, and, and allow them to be part of that creative process. Awesome, that's great. Um, so Annie Rubin had a question that I wanted to uh, get to because I have the same question myself, which is, so you're monitoring trends, you're trying to listen to the audience and meet them where they are. Um, do you do any kind of social listening um, or make audience lists to kind of keep an eye on trending conversations? And do you use any tools that you'd recommend for replying to mentions? My goodness. Um, in a perfect world, we would do all of that. Um, fun fact on it, like the actual, you know, social media crew, it, it's just four of us. Uh, it, and so if we had the resources to be able to invest time in, in, in things like that, I mean, we use Hootsuite um, for most of our scheduling and Hootsuite actually does have some very good um, listening software. Um, but most of most of our social media listening is genuinely just done organically. You know, it is watching our posts. We follow local influencers. We follow all the local media so that we can look at the comments and replies to their posts. And it really is, it's an organic process with us. So, you know, we physically go and each one of us goes and reads comments and replies and goes that route. Uh, in a perfect world, yeah, if we had some more resources and some more people on the team, we'd probably set up, you know, actual ingrained processes for it. But, you know, we kind of have to do the best we can with what we have. Yeah. So most of the, the examples that we looked at today were from Twitter. Um, tell us a bit about the different platforms you use and specifically, um, there's a question in the chat, what have been your best platforms to reach younger audiences, teens and early twenties? Absolutely, so we're, we, we have a few different brands. You know, Ottawa Public Health as a brand is, is on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Um, we have a, a brand called The Link Ottawa, which is specifically for younger audiences. That, that's on uh, Instagram, TikTok and, and uh, Facebook. We, and nobody get excited. I'm, I'm a terrible dancer, so I'm not doing TikTok. 
Um, we have a page called Parenting in Ottawa, which is on Facebook. We have a page called Aging Well in Ottawa, which is also on Facebook. Um, our, our best vehicle so far for reaching younger audiences has been Instagram. And it, it's, it's interesting, you know, because if you look at our Instagram page, it has an entirely different look and feel to our Twitter account. I mean, the posts are identical. You know, there's, we still use a lot of humor, but it is, it's an entirely different experience. Um, I remember the golden age of Facebook. I vividly remember the night that I got a friend request from my mother on Facebook. And I spent about 45 minutes purging my account before I accepted her friend request. And so you have to remember that, you know, when Instagram started, Instagram was born in that time of, of young people wanting to get away from the place that their parents had suddenly come and joined. So Instagram is a space where people went to get away from a lot of that, a lot of, you know, the corporate brands or whatnot. So you have to be accepting of that as, as you go in. And you have to accept the way that the different platforms will shape your messaging. Like, I'll, I'll roll through this quick. Um, media mediates, right? Famous Canadian Marshall McLuhan, he said, the medium is the message. The way that you choose to send your message has a significant impact on the message itself. So a great way to think about that is, let's say, let's say uh, Carolyn, I wanted to say happy birthday to you, right? So I could, I could what? I could send you a text. Uh, I could write you a birthday card, I could write on your Facebook wall, or I could, you know, call you or come see you. You know, if I send you a text, it's just going to be the words on your screen on your phone, you know, happy birthday. And you're going to read it in your own voice. And you're going to be like, oh, great. Thanks, Kevin. Yada, yada, yada. Um, if I send you a card, it's going to be the same thing. It's going to, it's going to be words and you're going to read it your own voice, but it'll be a little bit different. You know, I'm a grown adult. So therefore the I on happy birthday is going to have a circle on it instead of a dot because I'm a grown up. So it's going to have that, that personal touch, you know, that, that personal tone and, and style of the writing. You know, right on your Facebook wall, Facebook's got the different animations. It's still words on your screen that you're reading to yourself, but there's the animation behind it. There's my photo there. Um, if I call you, you know, if I call you and say, hey, happy birthday, it's still those same two words. But now, now it's my voice. You know, now there's the inflection, the emotion of the voice coming out, you know, and if I, if I were to come see you, at which... I, mean, I don't know how that suddenly turned into like a ridiculously creepy thing. But anyway, let's just assume that like we were friends and we worked together. Uh, and if I were to come see you, you know, I'm a, I'm a very animated talker. So now you've got all my body language. You can see my face. You can see the smile. You know, maybe there's a handshake and a hug and, and there's that there's that contact. But it's still the exact same message. You know, look at look at the difference of where we just went in this little like minute and a half thing of from the text to the to the in person. It's the exact same message every time, just happy birthday, but drastically different experiences for you as the audience of that message. And the only thing that's changing is the way that I'm choosing to send you that message. You know, so Twitter is a fast paced environment full of media. A lot of people are accessing it uh, in, in Ottawa. A lot of the media use their, their desktop for it. Facebook is kind of half and half. Instagram is all mobile. So it's all on small little screens. It's very visual. So if you're going to use different channels for the same messages, you have to be mindful of the way that those channels are going to alter and shape your, uh, your messages, which I know wasn't really the question, but it was a great way to, to kind of throw that in. Yeah. So uh, next question is related to, to the politics angle of this, which is how do you keep politics out of this, right? Assuming you try, you do try, particularly since public health has been politically weaponized, or is that a uniquely American thing? Um, It'll depress us if the answer is that, yeah, that's just our problem. But assuming that you have some shared challenges there, how do you deal with that? Um, here, yeah. I mean, like, I, was, I obviously have no idea what you're speaking about down there, yeah. you know, um, at all. I've never, I've never encountered that. Um, yeah, we, we kind of have to remain neutral. Um, we're a taxpayer-funded organization, so we aren't really allowed to, to start, you know, supporting one political leaning over another. Um, we try as hard as we can to, to stay out of anything political, even something as simple as, you know, our, our, our prime minister got vaccinated, you know, so we, we, we liked and retweeted the post, and the leader of the official opposition also got vaccinated, so we made sure to go and, you know, show some love to that post as well, and, and we, you just, you, you have to, I don't want to say stay in your lane because that's got such like a negative connotation to it, but it's what we talked about before, you know, what, what is your mandate? What is your purpose of being online? You know, we as a public health account, nothing about politics is in our mandate. So it's not a space that we play in. So we try as hard as we possibly can to, to stay neutral and, and stick with just public health messaging. So I think that probably a lot of, you know, folks on the call who, you know, th think this sounds great and they're interested in doing it, but they are going to look back at their social media accounts and see a bunch of, functional, factual, public health, dry content, and wonder, 
is it going to be weird if I just suddenly shift to, to telling jokes? So I guess tell us a little bit about your experience, you know, transitioning into this tone and like lessons you learn or advice you give to others who kind of want to move in that direction. Absolutely. Um, you know, as I've said, with the, it was a gradual thing for us. You know, I, I started with the organization three years ago um, and where the account is now versus where it is three years ago is, is almost night and day. Um, and even before myself, you know, where it was then and then until my start, same thing. It, 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 has, to, it has to happen organically. It has to happen naturally. Um, you know, you can't all of a sudden just go and start posting a bunch of gifts and memes tomorrow morning. Um, it has to be you have to be able to play the long game and have the patience and accept the fact that this is going to be a long, drawn out process of, of adjusting the style. Um, and, and that being said, though, you know, public health content can be can be engaging without being funny. I mean, it's a matter of just, you know, looking, looking where your audience is. You know, we've had great success with posts of, you know, to Ottawa tourism showing how to explore Ottawa's museums and sites and all that virtually. Nothing about that is humorous, but it's a great type of content to put out when people are, when there's currently a stay at home order in place and people are in their homes. So it's less of a, you know, how can you find ways to be funny and more of a way of how can you find ways to speak to your audience in the way that they are going to respond to. And you do that by trying different things and seeing how it goes and then adjusting accordingly. Well, Kevin, those are all the questions that I have, and those are all the questions that we have in the chat. We have about two minutes left. Um, what have we not asked about, or what lessons have you learned over the course of, of this work or this pandemic that, that you'd want to leave folks with? Absolutely. Um, well, first off, I mean, losing your hair is a great way to make it easier to get up in the morning. So let's make sure we mention that. Um, you know what, I, I think one of the, probably one of the biggest lessons we've learned in, in this pandemic is, um, is the absolute need to, to be ready to shift and be ready to move. You know, um, your audience will tell you, like they will let you know the type of messaging that you should be doing. They will let you know the information that they want. They will ask you the questions that they want answered. Um, and everything that you do has to be focused on your audience. You know, it, it's, it can't be said enough, you know, you aren't talking to them, you're talking with them. And if you are going to build a relationship, you have to make sure it's, it is a proper give and take and that you're willing to listen to everything that they say. Um, and once again, I, I'm kind of at a loss for a really great inspirational way to end this sentence. So I'm just going to continue, you know, just doing this awkward drawn on thing. Right. Yeah. All right. And with that, thank you so much, um, Kevin, for taking this hour to, to join us. I mean, in addition to being immensely helpful. It's also been a lot of fun, um, both to see the content and, and to learn from your experiences. So thanks. Thanks for joining. Thank you, everyone who took the time to listen in and ask questions. Um, as always, we'll be sending out the recording of this and the slides, which in this case are basically just out of public health Twitter, Twitter feed. Uh, we'll be sending those around nonetheless. Um, and any other questions for Kevin, please send our way and we'd be glad to, to forward those to him afterwards. Um, and thanks as always, we'll be in touch in the next couple of days with news on our next webinar. Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you.